So yeah, hi. Um, I'm kind of nervous. I hope that's not too uh, audible. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, web extensions in Rust today. And uh, the premise is kind of, I did it because I can. Um, my experiences today are from trying to port a web extension from JavaScript to Rust, um, because after I built it, I just realized, hey, we have WebAssembly, what stuff can I do with it? Um, and yeah, so I just sat down and started trying to build this web extension. And yeah, the purpose of this talk is just to give a little insight into um, the bits and pieces, how to piece it together to get something working. Um, we're gonna build, yeah, not the great stuff, but um, it's in Rust, so it's awesome anyway, right? Um, now that I told you why we did it, um, or why we do it, uh, let me tell you how. Um, a bit about web extensions. Um, for those who don't know, those are the add-ons you can install in Chrome and Firefox, uh, in Microsoft Edge, and even in Safari. Um, so it's a common standard. And the extensions are built on web uh, technology. So we write the extensions using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Uh, that's why they are called web extensions. And today we're gonna learn a bit about the basics. Um, that's apart from the Rust uh, part. Then we're gonna experiment a lot with it. And at the end, I want to talk about a nice build shop so you can build the things you want to do comfortably. Um, at the heart of uh, web extension, there's a manifest JSON. That's basically a bunch of metadata, what resources you want to load, and the rest of the structure of the web extension is really up to you. So that's good because we have a lot of flexibility uh, when we want to automate stuff. Um, and then I'm just gonna show you a really simple manifest JSON. Um, that's just telling the browser, hey, um, I have the extension named Carl's GitHub Enhancer. That's add, that's vital info to GitHub repos. Um, it has a content script um, that matches the domain github.com. So uh, we have a permission model and uh, with the contest script matching, you can basically uh, just say, hey, I don't need every domain. I just need this domain. We also have other permission models, uh, which I will come back to later. And yeah, so we have this manifest JSON. We have some files somewhere. How do we distribute it? It's basically just a zip file. Uh, when you upload your extension to the Chrome or Firefox web store or extension gallery, you just upload a zip file. Except for Safari, because that needs to be different, uh, you build a whole app out of it. Luckily, there's an easy command to do that, so we don't have to play around with Xcode. Um, yeah, so that, that was a short introduction. I'm gonna talk about a few details. Um, in the coding session. So I'm gonna switch to my editor and that's basically the main part. Didn't prepare many slides. Let's search for Visual Studio. Okay. Um, I have uh, the package folder in my project is, should be the, yeah, exactly. That's uh, the manifest JSON we are generating. So as I said, um, that's just a bunch of metadata description. We have a content script for Rust Lins AT. That's gonna do something. I'm gonna show in a minute. Uh, we have some web accessible resources. That's another permission thing because um, we work with Rust. Uh, we have to add our WebAssembly files here to load them in. That was one of the hiccups I found and the, the Yarn lock is only there because I was a little too lazy to remove that from the automation. Um, 
Then we have uh, permissions. We want to access the storage. That's going to be important later for the first uh, extension. It's not really relevant. Um, down here, that's just things to make Firefox happy. They need some Gecko ID. So that's there. And yeah, as you can see in the package folder, I have node modules, which is a web extent, um, which contains a web extension polyfill. That's there because uh, even though it's a standard, all the browsers, yeah, kind of understand um, efficient development is, is best done with this polyfill. So our base of uh, coding is Firefox. And then for Chrome and Microsoft Edge, we use this polyfill to just cut down on development time. Um, we have some stuff that's going to be relevant later. And yeah. So I'm going to show you my Firefox here. And I want to show you what the extension does first, and we jump into the code in a moment. So whenever you visit Rust Linz AT in the console, it says, hello, Linz. That's really one of the first steps I took with my non-Rust extension to just get some output anywhere to see if it's working. And let's jump into the code. I have a scripts folder here, which contains uh, sub projects, which contain the extension scripts. And this is really, really simple. Um, when we work, work with the web, sorry, when we work with the web extensions, uh, we work with uh, WebAssembly. So everything you know from working with WebAssembly and other projects applies here too. Um, and we just import the log one function from WebSys and put a JS value in there. And that's our console output. But that's not really much and um, it's not changing something about the website. So, the next thing I did was just search any element I could alter in an easy fashion. And for GitHub, I choose to replace the logo. Let me open my terminal here. And let's change it to the scripts folder. So because of the way I set up the project, um, every script I write uh, is a is its own contained Rust project. So to create a new script, I just say cargo new um, GitHub logo replacement. And I'm gonna talk about the build process later again, so you can know what's going on. Um, I forgot to say it's a library um, with every WebAssembly project you have to um, set the library type. So um, we need our CDI lib. I just needed to look at my example <laughs> to uh, quickly spy on the spelling. So to get a WebAssembly uh, output, we need to say this uh, is a CDI lib. Um, and for that assembly project, we also need Wasm bind GAN as a dependency. Okay, so um, as I said, the thing we wanna do here is um, search for the GitHub logo and replace it with something. Um, let's just set this up really quick. By the way, my project setup really confuses Visual Studio Code for some reason. So my autocomplete is not always working, which might hinder a bit, but we'll get through it. So if you ever worked with uh, WebAssembly and Rust before, uh, we have some macros to use. And one of those macros is Wasm bind again. 
And if we use this macro with uh, an extern C, we can import JavaScript functions into our code. So in the other example, I imported the log one function into my code. So I can log to the console, but that's actually another way. I can just import the log function from JavaScript. The way that's working, I'm defining my uh, function that's named log and it gets a message, which is a string pointer. Um, now the wasm bind can macro has some settings basically that's about namespacing. Uh, it even has some sugar about catching errors and async functions, but we don't use that now. We just say um, this function is in the console namespace. Okay, and then of course we need some entry point to run this code. And you can either export a function to JavaScript and uh, then call it from the JavaScript part. But I just want to write Rust here. Not a single line of JavaScript is in this whole project. So what we do instead, we define a public main function and we export it with well from bind again, again, and with a start parameter. So now when we load the web assembly, it automatically starts our function. And because we have uh, the log function, we can now just say um, log test. And I'm gonna make that a reference and now I need to edit my top cargo toml because I, I did some stuff here. I'm gonna explain it later. Um, and oops. basically what I do here is I have um, an array of content scripts and I just edit my Oh, that's the wrong script. Um, I need the other one down there. Um, and I add my cargo toml here and it gets built automatically in the background and is inserted into the manifest JSON. So if I type uh, make here, uh, we should get a new manifest JSON in a moment. Of course it's not working. <laughs> I, I just fixed this because uh, before I started the talk and now we're gonna do some live debugging. I just love it. So wonderful. <laughs> um, let's see, where are we? Um, can't find library. Oh. Yeah, of course. Um, it's a bit maybe lib rs and not main rs. Okay, that was an easy fix. Whew. <laughs> no, come on. Yeah, um, it's taking some time right now. And we get another error. Cannot find function log. The best examples are those that don't work when you use them, right? Um, wait, cannot find log. Am I blind? This Okay, I don't think this needs to be a reference, but I don't think that will fix the problem. Carl, can it be that in line three, you are missing a D? So shouldn't it be bind gen? Oh, <laughs> thank you. I would have never found that. As I said, Visual Studio Code is not much help with the setup because it gets hella confused with the top level cargo tumble, but yay, thank you. It worked very nice. 
So let's look at a new manifest JSON. Uh, in our content scripts, we now have a second object uh, that matches github.com and that uh, loads our now GitHub logo replacement JS. So in the background, uh, it automatically generated the GitHub logo replacement version and made this whole thing working. Um, let's go back to Firefox. No, not that one. Uh, that one. I already have a GitHub tab open here and because um, some magic in the background, uh, basically live reloading for the extension, it already printed out test. So every time we open a github.com website, it now prints test. So the next thing is um, how do I get to the logo? I, I have this GitHub logo up here and with JavaScript, it would be easy. I would do just a query selector on this object and then would do some magic with it and yeah, just replace the SVG in here with an image. So to do it in Rust, we have to take a few more steps, um, which is one reason why I said this is only because I can, because it's not really, um, the best or easiest way to get to the um, finish of what you want to do. Um, first of all, we need, um, so let me start by saying we need um, WebSys. WebSys allows us, it's a crate that allows us to access the normal JavaScript APIs like document.querySelector in Rust. So, Let's add a dependency to our project. And I'm just going to copy paste here because we need quite a few features and I don't want to do that by hand. Um, so the features of WebSys are very, um, like it can be very uh, broad because sometimes you just need a lot of stuff. Um, right. So back to the code file. Um, First of all, to access our document in WebAssembly, we need a window. So the window is um, WebSys with an underscore window. And we're going to error out. No global window exists, which should never be the case. And then we can access the document of that window we have now. That's window document. And again, we're going to error out if we don't find a document in a window. But again, this should not happen. OK, so WebSys has a lot of little quirks uh, that I needed to get used to uh, coming from JavaScript. But um, in the end, it's really nice because I don't have to relearn the API. I now have my document and I can just uh, make a, a query selector. Uh, it's spelled differently. So according to the um, best practices in Rust, it's a snake, uh, no, not snake case. It's an underscore in all um, small letters. In JavaScript, it would be written like that. So that's a uh, difference. And just so you know where I get this uh, query selector from, um, it's not the best uh, thing because the A element here has no ID. So we have to trust GitHub to not change anything about it um too much and i chose to go with the a with the area label homepage as a query selector if you don't know how query selectors work um they are basically css selectors so uh, in css you could style the element by searching for a with the area label homepage and you can use the same selector in uh, javascript or in the query selector API. So this looks like this. And we need to 
funnily enough, we can't use single quotes. We have to use um, the escaped um, uh, quotes for the selector in here. Um, yeah, and we want to unwrap that, of course. So what we get with this um, query selector is an element. And yeah, I'm going to pause here for a mo moment. Uh, we're going to come back to the logo wrapper and how to uh, change the element um, down, uh, down there. Um, what we do need to do first, uh, which I totally <laughs> uh, overlooked, is we, we need to create an image element. Um, before we can replace uh, or to replace the SVG and the logo, we need an image element to place in there. We could, of course, just write um, text in there, but um, with an HTML image element, we automatically get the right thing. And I'm just going to import. Um, so, so uh, WebSys um, exports all this, uh, these different elements um, as their own type, which must be a heck of a lot of work. But they are defined somewhere, so they export it that way. And we can just, um, yeah, we, we need an image URL because um, we, we need an image element. Sorry, I need to slow down a bit. I'm really nervous. This is my first talk. <laughs> uh, so we, we're going to make a new image element. Um, and we can error out here. Um, this, of course, should not happen either because you should always be able to create a new HTML image element. Right. So an HTML image element is um, this tag. And uh, with uh, the type we we get some things we can set and one of those things so we can set the attributes source is an attribute and if you just create an html element it doesn't have the attribute uh, source so it's really i was surprised how strictly typed this stuff is at this point um right so we have a function that's named set source. And yeah, what's what's our source? Um, there's again a bit of magic going on. I already pre prepared a new GitHub logo, and those artifacts get um, copied to my package folder. So we have the PNG here too. Uh, but how do we access it? Uh, access it. So with um, with web extensions, we have what's called web accessible resources. And um, to get a URL to this resource, we need to use a special function. Um, the function is called get URL. And yes, yeah, so it path. By the way, you can just name those um, parameters here and what you want, uh, JavaScript doesn't care. Um, it just cares about the order. And oh, we need a macro. And this is in the namespace. Um, browser runtime. So if you have uh, in JavaScript, this would be called browser runtime get URL. So if we have this uh, namespacing with the dots, you can just use several namespaces at this point um, and just use the function directly that way. Okay, so we now can get to our URL. Let's make a new URL element or 
URL text above uh, image URL. Um, let's uh, just get URL. And here we can just uh, use uh, the direct path. Uh, we don't need um, a, a relative path because we are thinking of the top of the package uh, folder here or at the, the same level at the manifest JSON. So we have our image URL and we're gonna say, yeah, we're gonna set that as a source here. And now we have an image element that has a source. And from our testing, I already know that um, we need to set the width of this um, element to 84. Now we also need to do something else. And again, this is kind of, we, we do it in Rust because we can. We need to add a bit of styling because it's not vertically aligned that way. And um, that was a bit of a learning curve here because um, we can't set the style directly via set style, but with um, WebAssembly, we have to get the style context, uh, some frameworks would say. And then in this, this style we have now, we set the CSS text. Well, that's a bit cumbersome, but um, again, I'm only doing this because I can in Rust, not because it's the best way to do it. You can just include CSS with web, SM, uh, with, with web extensions. It's really, really easy. So that wouldn't be a problem. Okay, so we have an image element with the right CSS class. How do we display it? And depending on um, if we found a logo wrapper up here, so we're back here, um, that's an option. So uh, we don't know yet if we found one and we're gonna match that. And if we have some, we're gonna set the inner HTML of this wrapper to image element outer HTML. Um, that's honestly just something I use that way from JavaScript. I don't know if the outer HTML is needed here, but we need to get some text we want to put into the other text. So that works. <laughs> and if we have no uh, wrapper, we're gonna just log to the console. And the logo wrapper was not found. Okay, so a quick recap of the code. Um, we search for an existing logo up here. Um, then we get uh, the image URL because when we use an extension, there's, um, I'm, I'm gonna show you in a moment what the generated URL is. And then we search for the element on the page. Uh, no, then we create a new element on the page set some properties and then we set the new element as the content of the old element. Let's see if this works. The build process is definitely not the fastest um, because I'm using a build RS that's yeah, doing quite a, uh, some work. Lock not found in the scope. Wait, where's some bind gang? That's not the same error as before. Wait, we, we locked already from this, right? We had some test lock here. Uh. Get your L, wait. Chase namespace. Ah, <laughs> of course. Let's see. This should work then. Yay, it worked. So um, nothing changed here because uh, with our last run, we also, uh, already had the GitHub logo replacement. Um, 
but I'm going to show you um, what a JS file, the generated JavaScript file does. Um, this is prelude loaded by the WASM pack crate. And in the end, at the bottom, um, we load and we use the same get URL here we just used to generate a URL to our WASM file and we run that through WASM bind again. And this should result in, yeah, GitHub having a nice logo for the first time in its history from a really good product. So for those who don't know, uh, this is a GitLab uh, logo and I kind of love GitLab. Uh, so it uh, was a no-brainer for me to put the logo of the better product on here. <laughs> As you can see, when I reload, uh, there's a little delay in there, but we get the new GitHub logo and we could do anything here. And we could, the way I altered this logo, we can alter anything on this website. So we could uh, change all the colors to pink. We could change, um, I don't know, uh, we could load in new fonts. We could make the buttons, uh, uh, the buttons spin when we click it and stuff. So um, using the web extensions, you really have access to every part of the website and even more depending on the browser. Okay, I'm gonna check time here right now because I have prepared two other um, extensions, but I think it's better right now to talk about the build process and then we can see if I can get into the other stuff too. So- Oh, can I sneak in a question here? Yeah. Um, Christian asks, would it be possible to somehow register also a handler function like, um, like for instance, HTML button click or something like this uh, using Rust and, and such, a, um, such a tool? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, let's wait a second. So the APIs are there. Um, I, I know that I just know at the top of my head what the exact syntax is. Um, basically, we, we have the logo wrapper here, and um, you, you can, um, it's a bit tricky because um, you can't pass a Rust function, you have to pass a JavaScript function, but you can pass a Rust um, um, Lambda to uh, call a Rust function. But yeah, you have the same API and can uh, uh, react to those events. Um, I Let me have a look. I don't think I have it in my examples anywhere. No, I, I don't have an on click, but it's definitely possible. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I spent way too much on this, uh, time on this build process really way too much time, but it was so much fun. Um, I'm, I'm gonna jump into the cargo terminal a bit. I have this, um, a cargo ha ha uses terminal and I can just use my own keys in there and add new arrays and stuff. So what I did was, I, don't, I didn't want to um, manage two version strings. I didn't want to manage two authors and stuff. So I just thought, hey, it would be cool if I have it all in one place. And when I bump my Rust version, my crate version, uh, I just get the correct manifest for it. So I did exactly that. And um, the uh, web extension, here, metadata web extension is just stuff I use to generate the manifest to uh, JSON in the end. Uh, so jump into the build process. Create manifest is a really, really bad function because it's so big and not split it up. But um, anyways, it works. <laughs> um, I read the cargo file, then I pass the cargo file. And then, yeah, I, I just save the gecko ID and the object is from the JSON crate which allows me to create Java 
script objects on the fly. And then you can see here, I create a JavaScript object on the fly. That's my manifest chase. So far, so good. We have content scripts and background where I put stuff in. We are not yet at the background, um, but I'm gonna touch on it a, a bit later. And we set some variables, metadata. And what I did then is I just copy over the artifact pass. And um, that's named script here. But, oh yeah, right, that, that's named script here. It shouldn't be named script, it should be named file. But basically what I do here is um, we have this web accessible resources. Uh, wait, so. so if I don't put my logo into the web accessible resources, a web extension on GitHub cannot read my logo. Oh, wait, I promised you to show you the logo URL because um, that's containing the extension key. Um, wait a second. Just then copy this in so you can see it in big. Um, so the get URL puts uh, this whole mods extension, the extension ID in front of the GitHub logo. But we can't access this if the manifest doesn't know that this file should be accessed. So that's the reason I go through the artifacts folder here and put everything into the web accessible resources. Then I go through the permissions. Um, this was the storage permission I mentioned earlier. And then I go through the content scripts. And in my cargo tumble, I made something. I, I directly say, hey, that's not a JS file, that's a cargo tumble. So if I'm, I'm going to skip a few things here, but the interesting part is here. If it's a JS file, I just push it into the JS portion of the script of the content scripts part. But if it's a Toml extension, I search for, I have a little function that gets me a clean package name. And then I call a function that's named build script. And to build this web assembly, I use a grade that's called uh, Wasm pack. And the cool thing is that's usually a CLI command. So I would go onto my console, let's change it to scripts, and I would say Wasm pack, hello lints. I am. Um, I, I don't know the syntax right now. Well, maybe I have something in my history. Yes, there it is. Um, Wasm pack build, UST web, um, hello lens. And that's building web assembly with the, let's see where I put the um, hello lens package. So I get the JS file, I get TypeScript definitions by default, and I get my WASM file. But I didn't just want to call some CLI uh, command. I just imported the crate up here, WASM pack, and I'm using it directly in here. So I'm that, those are the WASM pack build options, and this is the WASM pack command. And I'm running that directly in my build script because that way I have way better control over error handling. Theoretically, in the end, it didn't matter, but it was fun to do. <laughs> and yeah, so in the, I need to adjust the JavaScript a bit because <clears throat> usually um, it, uh, the JavaScript just loads wasn bind gam a bind again and then expects you to load your wasm yourself. So I didn't want to do that for every um, script I want to write in the future. So I load this whole thing into my memory. I add at the end this little uh, wasm bind again. Let me get out here. This was at the bottom. 
So this gets automatically placed for every script. And if I load two scripts um, into the same page, which, uh, for example, if I have two separate scripts for github.com could happen, um, the let at the top of JavaScript of the JavaScript code, um, let wasn't bind again, uh, I can't rebind the value. And so I'm wrapping this whole thing in an anonymous function that gets called. So that's some stuff I stumbled upon that was in a way of automating all the things. Uh, yeah, but now I can relax and lean back and just let my build RS do all the things I don't need to do from hand. Yeah, so um, we uh, it builds my project here. And if it's um, successful, it pushes the JS file to my scripts from the content scripts and it pushes my WASM file into the web accessible resources. Um, yeah, the, the rest of the build script is not that uh, interesting. Um, this is what it looks like if you just uh, call a command. And so I could have used uh, this to run WASM pack at this point, for example. Um, but we're using Yarn to install the um, polyfill for Chrome and uh, Edge. Yeah, that's the build RS. Um, I don't know from the timing, I could jump into um, the existing code and write a bit, uh, talk a bit about uh, what else I did. Um, are there any specific things you would like to see? <laughs> Feel free to do so. We have still ten minutes left. Uh, okay. I have currently no uh, no urgent questions here in Discord, and I'm very much enjoying your build script. <laughs> That's nice. So um, let's close this. Um, I have um, yeah. I, I'm just gonna jump in here. Um, at some point, I had a little code that just showed me if, if you go on the web extension um, repository on GitHub, you get an alert in JavaScript that's saying, hey, you installed this extension on this and this day. And then I realized, hey, um, at, the, at the beginning, I had this code. Um, assigning the installation date when you first open the GitHub page. But you could install the extension and a week after visit your first GitHub page. So that's not really useful. So suddenly I had a second script that's running in the background that's called set real install date. So all this does is it um, gets the current time and it saves a setting. Now, the safe setting accesses browser storage local. That's part of the web extension API to um, save um, settings of your extension. You could also in Firefox use sync. And uh, just like that, you wrote an extension that syncs its settings uh, with the Firefox account stuff. By the way, other detail here is um, the JS name for this function is set, but I renamed it to safe setting because it's a bit more clear what this function does when I use it down the line. And yeah, so I have this install time and I have this install time in my alert here. Why that? Here, install time. So this is where uh, writing a web extension in Rust really shines. Uh, because using the whole Webpack module stuff is really, really hard to get working. Because you have some cache files you need to, just like my WASM files, you need to, um, or code splitting it's called in, in the web world, uh, you need to load into the web accessible resources. 
and um, the easiest way to just get it uh, done is to just make it Internet Explorer 11 compatible. Uh, 11 compatible. <laughs> So you have one code file that's not importing stuff and, and you can't use JavaScript modules. Um, so you, can, you can't use um, modern web technologies like importing JavaScript from the files directly. So this is where I was, um, I think it's just cool that uh, the way I built it here, I can use uh, modules in my code. Um, without using a comp I think complicated uh, webpack setup that's um, I tried it it didn't work okay so I have this shared folder and here's my install time so I just created a new um, crate that's named shared and here I can put everything in that's needed at one at, uh, at more than one place in my project and um, yeah this is the does nothing much. It uh, gets the um, current date. It reports the current date um, if it wanted to. I don't even know what the get new install date. Oh, yes, that's the fallback. If we have an error in this uh, already existing install time, because here we access the saved install time. And if that's um, empty, we request a new one on, and we return that. That's the logic here. Yeah, so this is just a pub mod. So it's exposed and then I can use my install time in my other crates. By the way, um, you can just use path as uh, dependencies. So that's the way I'm doing it here. Uh, that way you can use local crates uh, as dependencies. Yeah. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> First, let me say thank you for the presentation so far and thank you for sharing it with us. I personally love talks where where you give the reason for why you do it because you can. <laughs> it's really, it's really <laughs> funny and it was interesting and I wasn't aware or let's say I wasn't familiar with this technology. I have a, a question. Um, I understood that many of the things you did just uh, was just because out of curiosity. Could you think of real world reasons where you would say, okay, if I had this or that problem, I would really use Rust for writing such a web extension and I would prefer Rust over JavaScript, for instance. Well, um, for me, it's a really complicated web extension. I would prefer to write in Rust um, just because of all the benefits like type safety. And um, also I have uh, this module system without the, for me, really complicated webpack setup, which I couldn't get to work. Um, so for me, in the end, uh, it was, uh, what was easier to use modules in the Rust world than okay. it was to use modules in the JavaScript world. And as always with WebAssembly, I think it's uh, the real benefit lies uh, in applications that use the same co code on a server part. So if you have um, a whole application with a um, defined um, uh, data model, you don't have to think twice about how to pass it, how to use it. You can just import the same code and uh, work the same way. Okay, I understand that. Um, uh, Christian was uh, curious. He he was thinking about exceptions in JavaScript and oh, how you deal with JavaScript exception uh, that turn uh, that that uh, that are raised in in Rust, or how do you handle uh, an exception that happens in JavaScript uh, when you call it from Rust? Yeah, okay, so um, Western Bind again really is smart about this. I can only, um, I, I, I can echo some things that are in the documentation. So um, with this up here, for example, you see we have an async, async function here. Um, I could use a catch property and not make this async and return some value. So um, this way, 
OS and bind GAN would just error it out on the console. And I, I would never get an error here. Um, but uh, with other errors you let into your application, basically, you can just use, um, you, you get results and options. So it's the same thing you're used to. Um, let me jump back, I think. Um, in the GitHub logo replacement here, it's properly, um, yeah, Visual Studio uh, properly displays uh, the types. Uh, as you can see, my unwrap here um, gives me an option. So WebAssembly uh, or the OS and bind again just translates uh, those things into results and options. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for answering this question. Um, I asked the audience, do you have any additional questions? Uh, by the way, I was really impressed by your yeah, by your build script. I really enjoyed it. Will you <laughs> by the way, will you share the location of the code? Can we take a look at it on GitHub? Um, or yeah, uh, it's already live for a few days. I shared it in technical stuff or uh, technical discussions. Ah, in, the Discord um, server. Okay, Discord. I see. Yeah. see. Ah, yeah, no, I see it. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested in all this code and you want to take a look or benefit from uh, the build script, that Carl has written. Take a look at the GitHub, uh, uh, sorry, at the Discord server in the technical discussion channel, you will find the link. Yeah, and also I wanna say, um, after I finish this whole thing, I think there's a better way to structure this. I don't think you need the separate crates. Um, I think it would be far easier to just write one crate with very, very many public functions. <laughs> and then you can just uh, call the public functions from your generated JavaScript files. Um, that would be another way to approach this. Okay, Carl, I don't get any further questions now, but I've seen we got a lot of uh, thumbs up on, on YouTube and things like that. So it seems that people were enjoying your talk and it was very interesting. It is a topic that uh, normally many of us don't touch every day. So therefore, it was great to, to see how this is done. Thank you very much for taking the time. I, I can assume that it was a lot of time preparing this talk. We really enjoyed it. And uh, I wasn't aware that this is the first talk of you. Uh, I personally think you did a great job. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for doing that. And 